writer would be the word that comes to mind, both in terms of writing for children and writing about the reading processes and reading work that children do. Delighted on this episode to be talking with writer Lester Lamanac. Uh, may I call you Lester? Is that okay? Oh, please. Yes, do. All right. All right. Well, thank you for joining. And as I was mentioning before I hit record, I think we just missed each other. And by just missed, I think we were among the many, many congregants at NCTE in Columbus just last weekend. Yes, it was it was quite a quite a large crowd, I think, this time. I was glad to see it increasing again. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That was my first in-person NCTE. I'd done AMLE. Uh, actually, mm-hmm. at that same space before, but that was the first in-person NCTE. It had been on my list for some time to stop by. Well, I hope it won't be your last. No, I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Yeah. It was, you know, next uh, year it's in time. Boston, so that'll be great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, I'll start by mentioning a couple of works and focuses. Is that the is that the plural of focus? Foki focuses. Um, <laughs> uh, craft, I think it's writing up on CI, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure how you pronounce it. Uh, we'll, we'll say it's optional. Many options. Um, so, writing okay. craft, comprehension, uh, reading to make a difference. These are all focuses, foki of yours, uh, and you've also written for children as well. So, I'm curious about. What's drawn you to both write for children to read and to write about the reading of children? Well, I started my career in 1977 as a first grade teacher. Mm-hmm. And I taught first grade, third grade, Title I or remedial reading. Um, then I was a university professor. So right now I've been in education in one form or another for 46 years. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, that's longer than a lot of teachers have lived. Um, So when I first started teaching, literature was not something that was prevalent inside the classroom. We had a lot of reading programs, basal readers and other sorts of reading programs, but we didn't have the rich classroom libraries that we have now. And children went to the library once a week for 20 minutes um, and got to check out a book. Teachers could go in and check out, you know, a small set for something like a unit of study, like um, planets or something. Um, But you had a week, you had to turn them back in. So uh, when I started moving through the system and finished my doctoral work and started working in a university, Um, I had an intense interest in children's literature and I taught children's lit and I reached the place where I just decided, you know, I grew up in a, in an era where we did not have cell phones and iPads and TikTok and Facebook and Twitter and 900 potential television channels you had a port swing and a grandmother and lightning bugs and the cardboard box that came from your neighbor's washing machine. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, we invented worlds and the box could be a submarine on Tuesday and a castle on Wednesday. And by Wednesday afternoon, it's a battleship and then it's a fort and then it's a cave, all depending on the stories we told uh-huh. and you know, like play required that you create a story you had to build a world create a setting establish who is which character inside this story so you know your role on the ship or in the cave um i lived in a story world um and i worry that children don't and jason i believe that our best hope for the world to continue to exist and not simply destroy itself and implode lies in the hands of our children Uh uh and their imaginations and their creativity. And I think that stories are a big source of nutrition for the imagination. So I look at it as an honor 
but also sort of an obligation, something to give back, um, to create stories that cause children to pause and reflect, to think about the poignant moments in their own life, mm-hmm. like the sunsets of Olivia Wiggins, and then other stories that would cause them to be curious about the world, like the King of Bees, or stories that cause them to sit down and reflect on their connections to their families, like Saturdays and Tea Cakes, or just to laugh and and look at the silliness of a peacock wishing it could lay eggs and hens wishing it had they could stop a car with three hens and a peacock with their big tail feathers and then just recognizing you know we make our best contributions in the world when we embrace and live out our truest selves mm-hmm. and so i think story holds tremendous potential for all of that um you know i think we're in this really troubled space right now where people want to make sure that you get access to the stories they want you to have rather than the stories you find attractive Mm -hmm. yeah so I'm, i'm hoping that we don't squelch that so much that publishers feel that they can't just run with the story because it's a great story and not get too caught up in the commercial aspect of it. Um, You know, and I think outside, a lot of people don't stop and realize publishing is at the bottom line of business. It it must Mm -hmm. make money or it can't continue to put books out. So I'm, I'm hoping they don't get scared and just say, no, we can't publish that story or this kind of story or that kind of story. Cause you know, children find themselves between the lines and in the crevices between the pages mm-hmm. in ways that we can't imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And what you're saying there just reminds me and makes me think of how powerful it is that we have the, these tiny little symbols that we arrange in strings, uh, kind of like DNA to to share something and to carry a message across from one space to another or from one time to another so it's a powerful form Mm -hmm. agree yeah you've shared a lot there and i'm curious you may have already answered this um but curious about an idea an approach a spark that uh if i'm a teacher listening in i can think about uh for connecting my students with literacy? Um, I sort of, I've been on a little kick for the last couple of years trying to boost um, nonfiction. I think children are naturally fascinated with nonfiction. I have a seven-year-old granddaughter. And when she was born, I sent books. Uh And I made sure that the books I sent included both, well, all poetry, fiction, nonfiction, a variety of types of fiction, a variety of types of nonfiction, because I wanted to spark that curiosity. Mm-hmm. And I think nonfiction does something that fiction can't, but the two can certainly work together. So um, one of the things I've been playing with is the idea that using the the teacher sort of natural inclination to read aloud from fiction, which is what we tend to do. And and it almost is a default and I don't see it, you know, I'm I'm not blaming anyone. It's just one of those things. It's the history of what we've done with reading aloud. So I take a book like The King of Bees that when I started writing it, I thought I was gonna write the story. of a young boy who fell asleep on a porch and the bees swarmed. Mm -hmm. And that came from someone um, that I knew who told me a childhood memory. And I thought, I can make a story out of this. Um, And I sat down and started writing and I realized I just didn't know enough about bees Mm -hmm. so that, you know, my fiction would ring true because even if it's fiction, you have to tell the truth about the insects in that story. So I had to stop. I just had to put it aside and spend a few months just digging into nonfiction for children and becoming uh, 
entrenched in nonfiction information, mm-hmm. just facts. So what I did, if you read a book like The King of Bees, and there are several books set up that way, where there is a, a storyline that runs all the way through, it's pure fiction, but it's imbued with fact. Uh-huh, uh-huh. All that information inside that text, what I hope is that that sparks children to ask questions. So I would encourage teachers to embrace the notion of questioning more than the notion of answering. Because a lot of what we do in the teaching of reading is to follow the read aloud or the independent reading or the guided reading with a set of questions to ensure that the children paid attention and understood. Uh Uh And, you know, after 46 years, I'm pretty convinced that the person who's generating the questions is the one who's synthesizing the information and creating summaries and digging into detail, doing all the things that we list as comprehension work Uh Uh to generate the questions. The kid who answers the questions is simply digging back through the text to find the interrogative version of the the statement version of the interrogative. Uh So I look for the language that matches what you asked me in the question, and I can pull up the nugget. That doesn't mean that I truly understood it. So I think if we said to kids, you know, here's we just finished the story. So I want you to pause a moment. Just sit quietly for 15 seconds and think. If we could talk to a beekeeper right now, what are the three best questions you could ask? Uh Uh You wouldn't ask, you know, have you ever been stung? Because you can be pretty sure a beekeeper has been stung. What's something that only a beekeeper could tell you? So let's think about those questions. I would give them this really archaic tool called an index card. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, you remember those? Yeah, yeah they, I use um, them often. Yeah, <laughs> I keep them right here on uh, the side of my desk, and that's what I make notes on. Yeah, um, it, index cards like three by five index cards. They're cheap, and hand them out. Give each kid three. Tell them not to put their name on it because who asked the question is not important, and I don't want them trying to, you know, I'm going to ask the best question. I want you to ask what you really want to know. Uh-huh. And so, if, you know, we just, you can be anonymous. So we take your questions, we drop them in a bucket. Um, and I just leave them alone. We go on about our day. At the end of the day, I'm going to sort those questions into three piles. One pile are questions that have to do with vocabulary. What's a hive tool? Uh-huh, uh-huh. What's a drone? Um, you know, what's a hive box? What are pheromones? And then I'm going to have another stack of questions that have to do with just basic facts. How many bees are in a hive? Uh Then I'm going to have questions that have to do with conceptual things, like the relationship between ideas, that if you have this set of facts, but you don't understand how they hang together, then what you've got is a set of facts. You have no way of organizing them. So I would want to look at things like why is that why are there so few boys in the hive and so many girls? Well, conceptually, if we understand that the girls do all the work, gather the food, groom the queen, take care and build the cells, and all the males do is mate with a queen from another hive when a new queen emerges, then you don't need as many boys to make the hive survive as you need girls who do all the work. Uh And so if I look at their questions and I start sorting them out, then what I would do is follow that up in the days that come after it. I would follow them up with read alouds from nonfiction. If the majority of your questions had to do with vocabulary, then I would choose introductory level material. Even if you're in the fifth grade, I'd find some books that are written for kindergartners and first graders and second graders that are going to build your vocabulary. Uh uh Once we read three or four of those, I'm going to pause and say, can you answer any of the questions that were asked on these cards? And we read them out loud. We answer them. We discard. We don't need them anymore. Uh What new question can you ask today that you couldn't ask yesterday? Because once you get vocabulary, you can fine tune your questions. 
And then I'm going to go to the next set of books, like a little more advanced level, more complex level books and try to build factual information and then start looking at the things that build the conceptual frames for those. So it ended up going to more and more complex books. And each time, what can you answer? What new thing can you ask? Uh And by the end of about four days, you know, just doing this during the time you would set aside for read aloud. So it doesn't have to be your science class. It doesn't have to be your social studies class. It doesn't have to be your reading class. Whenever you would normally read aloud, you would just sort of take this lead book at the top. And then I call it a waterfall. You can call it whatever. But it's like this lead book at the top and the rest of those books sort of tumble down out of it, depending on what the children ask. So everything's very student centered. Uh It's very organic in its nature because I might read to the same book to two different classes and get two totally different understandings because um, this one school I know in Rome, Georgia, they have beehives on the property. Their questions would be very different than questions from a school that let's say in a school that's inside an urban center and there is not a lot of green space and they don't see bees very often. And when they do, they swat at them because they think they're going to get stung. Uh-huh. Um, so their questions might be very different um, altogether. And so I would have different follow-up books on the basis of the questions. So right now I'm trying to encourage people to think about pairing their fiction and nonfiction uh-huh. by finding a fiction title that is imbued with information and facts that would generate interesting questions that would allow you to say, instead of saying, we're going to study bees, it's we're going to find answers to our questions. And it's really not about studying bees. It's about learning how to research, you know, generate your questions, find sources from that, organize your questions, figure out what you don't know, build your vocabulary, establish a background of facts, and then figure out how you can organize those into conceptual frames so that you can hold more information in your head. And it's really kind of simple. Yeah, yeah I love it. I love it. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the word encourage there. Um, so I was also going to ask, and, and you mentioned some of the challenges that teachers uh, are facing at the moment. So curious about encouragements to maybe people that are thinking of entering the profession or people that are new the new to the profession uh, in terms of teaching. Uh, these are challenging days, you know, probably more so than any of the almost five decades I've been in this work. But I would say to anybody, whether they're new, considering coming in or considering going out, you know, just stop and revisit what made you want to come. Uh uh You know, what made you want to come to this party? And do you still have that same desire? Do you still believe that you can make a difference by being in a classroom that you can do something that no one else can or that very few can. Um, And look at your passions. I mean, otherwise, you know, this is going to be drudgery. Uh Like, Be sure it is something you love to do and you enjoy the time with the kids. There's something you feel that you have that allows you to communicate in ways with certain age groups. Like I don't see myself as a high school teacher though at this age, I feel like I could teach certain things in high school, Uh Uh but I am far more at home with first graders through fifth graders, just because I don't know why it's just my, you know, it's just my wiring, my, my, interaction with kids and i think each of us knows that about ourselves Uh Uh, and we know where we fit and for young people um, like our high school students i would encourage them to try to figure out ways through their school that they can do some internship work Uh Uh um, some shadowing kind of work inside a school and i would encourage those people if you get a high school student in your classroom don't use them as your gopher or to, right. you know, collect things, litter, give them a small group, let them read aloud to kids, let them tutor somebody who's 
struggling with math or reading or science concepts. Let them see what it's like to be in this profession and look at yourself then as someone who is mentoring someone in. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we all need to just sort of stop and thank those people who've stayed. Yeah. This is the largest exodus of teachers from the profession in my memory. And um, the idea that people are just leaving in droves and with very good reason, you know, I get that. Mm -hmm. But there are people who stay. And, you know, we need to be talking to them. Why are you here? Why are you staying? Um, what is it that feeds you here? And how can we help make it better? Um, and I think, you know, those of us who have been around a while have seen a lot of things come and go. Uh -huh. And as uh -huh. crazy as this is right now, it too will pass. And something else will come behind it. And God help us. <laughs> yeah. you know, it could be worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Could be worse. And it could be a lot better. You know, we've we've seen a lot of things cycle through over time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, by means of a final question, uh curious also about resources that you would share for listeners. Um, directions you might point people in to um check out websites or uh, text or, or anything along those lines or uh, even outside of those lines. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of things that um, I think can be helpful with where we are. Mm -hmm. um, as we are moving and shifting how we approach the teaching of reading, regardless of the intentions of the people leading that movement, the application tends to be a very heavy emphasis on phonics mm -hmm. uh, in the primary grades with an increasing emphasis on skills as you move up. My concern is that that's going to cost us vocabulary and comprehension and joy. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Donald Miller's work on the joy of reading, it's like, let's go back and collect some of that joy up and around. Um, I would look at uh, the newest book that I helped write called mm -hmm. Critical Comprehension um, that I wrote with Katie Kelly and Vivian Vasquez. And the idea that comprehension is far more than giving the right answers to someone else's questions. And that if we don't teach kids to read with the text and pull from it what's on the surface, but then read against the text and push back against whose voice is privileged, whose is missing. Why is this angle being shown? What are you wanting me to believe? And approaching a text the same way we would approach a commercial of, okay, you want me to buy this toothpaste, but does it really do anything better than the one at the discount store with no <laughs> label on it? You know, like, What's what flip the ingredients over and they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. We encourage that among shoppers. We need to be encouraging that among children as they read science and social studies, fiction, as they read things um, currently, as we begin reading our own history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you can cherry pick and pluck away from the library. But if we raise critical readers, they're going to ask the questions anyway. Mm -hmm. And when you ask questions, you get thirsty for answers and they'll find the answers. They'll find those texts. So those are two resources that I'd suggest at the moment. Love it. Love it. Well, I, I appreciate the time, the insight, the encouragement, the conversation. Did we miss anything that you want to make sure to mention before we close? Um. I don't think there's a question per se, but I would encourage teachers just to remember the power that they hold. Mm -hmm. And um, we sometimes talk about, well, I can't do anything about this. You know, this is happening and I have no power. Your stories have power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the most powerful tools in humankind is story. And marketing has that cornered the notion of we're not selling a product 
we're selling a story and then you go buy the product because you fell for the story. You fell into the story. Mm -hmm. Um, So where are the stories of what's good in education? Everything we hear about education on the news and in the media is always what's wrong. And we're about to enter a national election. Every politician always has a promise to fix this bad situation. My first presidential election that I was old enough to vote in was the one that put Jimmy Carter in office. Uh And I have not seen an election since then where a president stood up and said, I am proud of the American education system. I've not heard a governor, a person running for governor or for Senate or Congress say those words. Uh We need our teachers every day sharing the stories of the good stuff that happened. Our little tiny, small town, local newspapers need to devote a quarter page every week, if ours comes out weekly, to good news from schools. Like we need to get this notion that school is a place where good stuff happens, uh-huh. but the power is in the stories and you can turn that tide. I also want them to recognize that they have power to break the human spirit uh-huh. or to let it soar. So let nothing you do cause any child to lose their dignity as a human, their integrity as a learner or their identity as one who is capable. And all of that lies in the power of a teacher. 